It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Podcast Special, String Theory, History, and Our Timeless God. Have you ever heard of the phrase biblical worldview? If not, here is a definition. Christian worldview, also called biblical worldview, refers to the framework of ideas and beliefs through which a Christian individual group or culture interprets the world and interacts with it. One of the things about biblical history that sets it apart from normal history is the supernatural aspect of it. Where else can you find angels and demons fighting for and against men, and a heavenly father pursuing the hearts of man and telling his story through his faithful servants? In this episode, before we get completely involved in the story of Solomon, we're going to set aside some time to discuss some of the aspects of the supernatural and how it possibly intersects with science and history in our world today. We see all through history a disagreement over the treatment of the supernatural in our lives. One of the best examples of this was the difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees during the time of Jesus. The Pharisees thoroughly believed that a Messiah was coming, yet they failed to recognize him, and they believed in the scrolls and words of the prophets and religiously obeyed the law of Moses, and they believed in the afterlife. The Sadducees, the other ruling religious party in Israel at the time, didn't believe in the supernatural realm, angels or demons, and didn't even believe in the afterlife. For an easy way to understand this, the sad you sees were sad you see. How about the crazy scene from John twelve twenty eight, when Father God spoke to the crowd at Jerusalem, answering Jesus, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there said it thundered, others said an angel spoke. The spiritual, those with supernatural understanding, heard what they thought of as an angel. You've got to give them some credit for having supernatural understanding, but they just didn't know the true nature and source of the voice. Those who discount the supernatural gave the scientific answer of thunder. This could tie to those who discount the power of God at work today. This leads me to the cool definition of the supernatural. Not to sound like a Sid Roth TV ad, I looked up the word supernatural. I love the definition of the word supernatural. Here it is. The supernatural is that which is not subject to the laws of physics or figuratively that which is said to exist above and beyond nature. So with all the shows today and the fascination with ghosts or demon hunters, however you want to look at it, there's such a hunger for the understanding of the supernatural. The powerful definition of the supernatural amazes me. The supernatural is not subject to physics or exists above and beyond nature. Above and beyond nature. Isn't that cool? Where God lives and reigns is above and beyond nature. And let's go further. God is above and beyond time and space as well. Taking this perspective, what about Jesus when he walked on water? He was supernatural. And at that moment in the spirit was not subject to the laws of physics. He was above and beyond nature, yet he was existing in that moment in our timeline, in our physical reality. Did he materialize the water below him, or did he turn lighter than water? We don't know for sure, but what he did was beyond our understanding of science and nature, and we know it. Miracles show the power of God over the natural rules and science of God's own creation. Beyond this, the miracles, and into the realm of the supernatural, there is a theory in science which is called string theory. And it's really, really interesting when you think of it in the terms of history and our study of it. It's just a theory. Let me make that clear. It's still only a theory, but it has spiritual implications. Let me explain string theory. It declares that there is 10, some say 11, dimensions of reality in our universe. It gets really out there, but we can understand the basic first three. Imagine a box. There is height, 
width, and depth. That's the first three dimensions. The fourth dimension is considered time. The remaining six or seven are really out there and they relate to multiple dimensions. It's just a theory and scientists haven't proven it out yet, but I love when science proves God. And I love how it supports our repeated theme of God being above time and space, for the heavens and heavenly realms would exist in the other higher six or seven dimensions. On the gotquestions.org website, I found this write-up regarding the question, does the string theory have any connection with belief in God? Here is an excerpt from the write-up. Thinking about God living in 11 dimensions and interacting with the four we have access to is an interesting mental exercise. I might explain why we can't see him, an observer living in four dimensions can't see all the 11 dimensional form. Although, ultimately, God cannot be seen because he has chosen to be seen only through the eyes of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1. If string theory is true, it might also show how he can interact with the world in ways that we can't describe, thus called miracles. And if God can move freely through all 11 dimensions, it would illustrate how he can be outside of time. So let's take this thought further. Say we dwell in the first four dimensions within a timeline of history. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said he encountered God and went into the third heaven. Could it be this is the later dimensions? Possibly darkness dwells in the fifth or sixth dimensions with the ability to come and tempt man in the first four. God in his overwhelming power dwells and has access to all the remaining dimensions. This is all too interesting and all too more powerful to consider the sheer limitations God placed upon his son for him to come to earth to live as a humble, weak human and to die on the cross. That Jesus, who is above time and space and nature, was willing to die on the cross is a staggering consideration. If this doesn't make you think Jesus is just totally awesome for what he did for you and dying on the cross for you and me, let's go further. Discuss the power that Jesus surrendered to die on the cross. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Going through the battlefield victories over dark forces we could do, but how about these verses? Job 9, 4. He is wise and hard and mighty in strength. Who has defied him without harm? It is God who removes the mountains. They know not how. When he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place, and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun not to shine, and sets a seal upon the stars, who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea, who makes the bear Orion and Pallades in the chambers of the south, who does great things, unfathomable, wondrous works without number. Or Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine according to the power that works within him. Further, God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. 1 John 3.18 Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the Spirit, and we assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Or Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You have known when I sent down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path, my lying down, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Now we arrive at omnipresent. This one's freaky to me because God is everywhere. My only explanation for this really can be the Holy Spirit. How about these verses? Psalm 139, 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. You are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. Or Jeremiah twenty three twenty four. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? 
So, so far we've covered how God is above time and space and nature and all-knowing, all-present, and all-powerful. Come on, God is outrageous. So I'm getting really excited with these thoughts. All right, this is making me joyful to know that my God is so awesome that he's beyond our understanding, our dimensions, and beyond our dimensional understanding. Maybe this is why I love history so much, because history is a taste of the heavenly perspective. God is omniscient and can see everything at once, our past, our present, and future at once. We are limited within our time, but are we? We live in the present and can see our present reality only, but if we study history, we can see the past like God, albeit within the scope and accuracy of our study. One would say that we are totally limited to only our present, and then again there's the study of the past, but this is not completely true either. Just as the study of the past is history, we can forecast our future with predictions and models and apply the study of the past, but this is very limited. The only certainty of the future is the taste of it that God leaves us through his prophets. Just as the study of history is the past, the study of the future is prophecy. Take the prophecies of the future that haven't been fulfilled yet like the Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which hasn't been fulfilled yet, or take any of the crazy prophecies from Revelation, or just the end of the book with the new Jerusalem coming down from the heavens. These words have not been fulfilled, but they will because God has spoken them from his perspective. When we read these prophecies, there's a quickening in our bodies because we're tasting in the heavenly perspective outside of present reality. So now that we have arrived at the concept of prophecy in the Bible, I've got to share a study done some times back regarding the accuracies of the fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus. This is a study by Peter Stoner from Westmont College in the 60s, and the article was pulled from Science Speaks Volume 4 by Moody Press in 1969. Here's an excerpt from the article. Professor of Science at Westmont College, Peter Stoner, has calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah. The estimates were worked out by 12 different classes representing some 600 university students. The students carefully weighed all the factors, discussed each prophecy at length, and examined the various circumstances which might indicate that man had conspired together to fulfill a particular prophecy. They made their estimates conservative enough so that there was finally unanimous agreement even among the most skeptical students. However, Professor Stoner then took their estimates and made them even more conservative. He also encouraged other skeptics or scientists to make their own estimates to see if his conclusions were more than fair. Finally, he submitted his figures for review to a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation. Upon examination, they have verified that his calculations were dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. Now we pull from a summary of his work found on the net. For example, concerning Micah 5.2, where it states that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Stoner and his students determined that the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to the present, then they divided it by the average population of the earth during the same time period. They concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem was 1 in 300,000, or 1 in 2.8 to the 10th to the 5th power. That's five zeros. After examining eight different prophecies, they conservatively estimated that the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That's 17 zeros. To illustrate how large the number 10 to the 17th, a figure with 17 zeros, Stoner gave this illustration. If you mark one, in, one of 10 tickets and place all the tickets in a hat and thoroughly stir them and then ask a blindfolded man to draw one, his chance of getting the right ticket is 1 in 10. Suppose that we take 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They cover all the state of Texas two feet deep. Now, mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes. 
but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that it's the right one. What chance would he have have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in one man, from their day to the present time, providing they wrote them in their own wisdom. Convinced God is awesome and that his words are outrageous? All right, now I'm getting crazy excited. That's our God, the impossibility of God. Is it that amazing? The only explanation I can give for that type of 10th to the 17th power explanation of the prophecies is that God is above time and space and nature, and he's all-seeing, and he's all-knowing, and he's all-powerful. Along these lines... My four-year-old daughter has this thing about those little tiny Gideon Bibles. She loves them. She has about five different color ones in her room. She has this game, and she brings me the Bible and randomly turns to a page, and she tells me to read. Another day, because I just love reading the Bible, and I was in her room, I took this little Gideon book and opened it to the first page. And you know the one? This is the first page before even the table of context. I read it, and it was amazing. I'm going to read it to you and check this out. Don't know how the Gideons came up with these powerful words, but they summarize the power of God through his word. Here's the first page of the Gideon's Bible, and I did notice this is only in the older copies of the Gideon's Bibles. As I read this, don't think we're just reading words, but try to picture the power and symbolism of these words and the descriptions of God's word. Here it is. The Bible contains the mind of God the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are true, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian charter. Here, too, heaven is opened and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end, and it should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It's a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It's given you in life will be opened at the judgment and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Convinced yet that God is awesome? Come on, if I hadn't read the Bible before, I would definitely be curious now. If I hadn't submitted to the Lord, who is all-powerful, all-seeing, and all-present, I would definitely be curious now. If I hadn't acknowledged the God who is above time and space and nature, I would definitely be curious now. And then for the history lover, and that God was and is and will continue to be above our boundaries of time, I would be curious. God, we ask you, like you stated in John 14, that you would come and dwell with your believers. I don't completely understand it, and you asked us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. I don't fully understand that either, and I think few do. God, you said in Ephesians 2, 4, that we dwell with Christ in heavenly places, I don't understand this either, Lord. But God, you did declare that those who seek you will find you, and those that who ask will receive, and knock and the door will be opened. Reveal yourself and increase our understanding and our wisdom. God, I pray and ask you to reveal yourself to myself and to those who listen to this podcast. Mm-hmm.